question number 50 from the homework. Something like this. Now, you notice I didn't write x equals yet because another way that this question could have been asked would be to give you something like this and just simply say, compute. Let those who have ears, <laughs> those with ears, let them hear. You might be given something like this and told to compute. So what would you do? Well, first off, they gave it to you in the form of an equation, but that is if you're told, if you're given something that looks crazy like this and you're told to compute it, a good trick is to just say, okay, let's give this thing a name, right? This is some, if indeed this is a number, because sometimes, especially with infinite processes like this, like, and even this even says, imagine that this continues on infinitely. When you have something that continues on infinitely, your hope is that it doesn't blow up. Like for instance, if I said this continues on infinitely, you'd say, well, one plus one plus one, plus, well, that's just gonna blow up. That's just gonna give you infinity. And so that happens to be the case in this case. In this case, we don't know whether or not this is going to actually give you a number or not. And so a nice trick is to say, let's give this thing a name. Let's assume that this thing that I'm trying to compute actually equals some number. And so we end up with your problem right here that you were given, which is, okay, we're going to call this thing, whatever it happens to be, we're going to call it X. And now you're in the realm of, I have an equation and I'm trying to solve for X. The weird thing is that X is already by itself, right? <laughs> like up until this point, you know, you, you have something like, like this on one side and you go, okay, ah, yeah, I have all my X's by myself. And so that means either X is one or it's zero, or perhaps you end up with an X squared equals four. And so you go, okay, I could take a square root of both sides and I find that X is either equal to plus one or X is equal, I'm sorry, X is equal to plus two or it's equal to minus two. But in this case, you have X all by itself but you're not any closer to finding out what X actually equals. And so there's a trick here. And we're gonna talk about that trick in just a second, but let's just, before we get there, let's just suppose, because we're trying to figure out what this thing is. Let's suppose, let's, let's turn this into a simpler problem first and think about how we would approach that simpler problem and then see if maybe we could do the same thing in our case. So the simple problem in this case would be, I just kind of look at this and think, okay, well, what is X? X is the square root of some stuff. So if I had a problem that was simply X is the square root of stuff, what would I do? What's something that you think you might want to do in this case? Um, square both sides. That's exactly what comes to my head, right? And there's no right or wrong answer with this. Like this, what would you do? I don't know, square both sides maybe? And so I'd say, okay, yeah, let's square both sides. That gives me X equals whatever is left over in here. Is that gonna help me over here? I don't know. I, I've never seen this before. I don't know what to do, but let's just try it and see what happens. So when I do that, I square the left-hand side and I get x squared. Now, when I square the right-hand side, I guess that kills that first root right there. And I'm left with, just like how I have here, right? I square it, and it gets rid of that root. And then whatever is inside of it is still there. And so this gives me 6 plus the square root of 6 plus square root of six plus square root of six and so on and so on, right? Okay, here's the trick. And if, if you haven't seen this trick before, like it's, you would never think to do this. But once you've seen the trick, when you see problems like this in the future, you'll go, oh, maybe I could use this trick. And this is a really nice trick to use when you have infinitely many of something. 
there's in fact a whole host of tricks that you could use when you have infinitely many things that you're trying to wrap your head around. But in this case, this is one of those tricks that you could use is you go, you, you, may, you notice this right here. Wait a second. This thing right here, this original thing that I was trying to compute, that is the exact same thing as this thing right here. Yeah, I manipulated the equation a little bit, but the problem told me this went on infinitely. And so peeling off one of the sixes did not change this thing. This thing still continues on infinitely. As a matter of fact, this thing that I have right here is my original thing. And what name did we give that original thing? X. X. So I could say, well, wait a second. This entire thing right here was the very thing that I called X to begin with. And so now I have that right there. All I did was say, well, wait a second. And this is the nice thing about giving this thing a name, right? We said, if this thing is indeed a number, then we could rewrite it and give it, just give it some name and we'll call it X. And then we do some manipulation and find, hey, look at that. That's the exact same thing that we started with. That thing has a name and it is X. And so, boom. And so this is a trick that you, that you learn. Somebody had, like, unless you're a super genius and you just figured this out on your own, somebody explains this to you, like there's an, a nifty thing you could do when, when the process has continued infinitely many times is you could pull one of those things off and you haven't changed it. That's interesting. It's very interesting how that works. But now that we know that, we could use this to our advantage. And so now we have this equation right here. And you tell me, how would you solve this equation? Hi. Hi. Okay, so tell me what to do to solve this guy right here. Um, hold on. Okay. And it has nothing to do with square roots. What do you? Subtract x from both sides. Let's subtract x from both sides. That gives me x squared minus x equals six. And then you would subtract six from both sides to make it a polynomial. Now we have a polynomial equal to zero. And we know how to deal with these guys. Now what do we do to that polynomial? Um, writing. Say what? Hold on. Sorry, I was writing. So oh. x squared minus x minus six equals zero, and then you have to factor it, right? We're gonna factor. We're gonna try. We're gonna try. This one may or may not factor. And that's the idea with these polynomials: is sometimes they factor, sometimes they don't. We don't know what to do when they don't yet. But I think this one factors. So it would end up looking like this. And what are my possibilities for the last ones? Um, one and six or two and three, I think. Let's try two and three. Yeah. And then to get, you need plus two and then minus three. I think so. That is what I think. Let's double check it. First gives me x squared. Outside is minus three x. Inside is plus two x. Minus three plus two is a minus one x. So that works out. Finally, we have our last, which is plus two times minus three, which is a minus six. So that works. That gives us two possibilities. X is equal to what or X is equal to what? X is equal to negative two or X is equal to three. Okay, now here's the question. 
x. Could that possibly be a negative number? Because when I'm looking at this, I'm seeing, OK, you have the square root of something. OK, first off, square roots aren't negative. But let's just, let's just be sure here, because sometimes funky things happen, especially when you take infinitely many things. But let's just see what happens. The square root of 6 is certainly a positive number. The square root of six plus the square root of something, which we know has to be a positive number, is also going to be a positive number. Mm. The square root of six plus the square root of six, well, that's certainly a positive number because the square root of six is positive. So all of that's positive. Square root of a positive is a positive. Plus, and so I'm just kind of continuing on and on and on and saying, well, yeah, no matter what, you're taking the square root of a positive number. This has to be a positive number. There's no way it could be negative. You couldn't have taken a bunch of positive numbers, taken their square roots, added them together, taken a square root, add them together, just take a square root, and end up with a negative number. So, and this is this is something that's that's going to hit us fast and hard pretty soon. Is we're going to have some situation where we're solving a polynomial in particular, a quadratic polynomial, that is a polynomial of degree two, and we get two answers. Oftentimes, we don't know which one of the answers works and which one doesn't, but oftentimes, one's positive and one's negative. And you could tell from the context of the problem, in this case, that the negative one certainly does not work. Like that'll happen again, like in physics, you'll often, this, you'll have a solution like this where X is equal to negative two or X is equal to three. And it's like, but X represents what time something happened. And it's like, well, it didn't happen two hours ago. Like it happened three hours after you did the thing, you know, from, and this is what I mean by context, oftentimes positive and negative are really the best way of looking at this. Because if you tried to plug this back in and check, oh man, you're never going to get to the end of that. You're going to be checking for the rest of your life, right? <laughs> like, and so the idea then is, all right, um, well, actually, hmm, that's interesting. You could plug it back in and check. Huh, that's cool. But anyway, um, usually when you have a negative answer and a positive answer, that's a really nice way to see which one of these has to be true. And so finally, we're going to say, well, this thing, X cannot be negative. It must be strictly positive. We have to say that. We have to make that note. Therefore, X is going to have to equal three. And therefore, this thing right there has to equal three. And what you could do, if you're so inclined, you could... Actually, let's do let's do it just real quick. We have we have some time. Let me let me pull up Wolfram from Alpha, our best friend. Can you see that right there? Yeah. So let's just see what happens. I'm going to do the square root of six, and why don't we go plus the square root of six like that and see what happens. So this is just the first two of these guys, and we get two point nine. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and see what happens if I go plus square root six again. In fact, what I'm going to do is copy and paste this a bunch of times, but let's just see. What's nice is it gives me a printout and we can see right here that, yes, that is the thing I'm trying to compute. And we can see that the more of these things I use, plus when I have three sixes, we end up with 2.98. Now let's go ahead and add one more in there, paste. And we have 2.997. Oh, that's nice. Let's do a bunch of them. Let's go paste, paste, paste. We'll do one more paste. And we're going to get a nice printout. It'll give me a pretty print. We can see, yes, this is the thing I'm trying to calculate. And the more of those root sixes that I add into the mix, the closer the answer does get to three. So this makes me think, ah, we're on, we're on the right track here. This does seem to be a plausible solution to the problem.
But anyway, I thought that was really cool. And I wanted to assign that one because I don't know about you. I think it's really cool that you could take something like this and actually compute its value. That, that does not seem to, at least to me, it doesn't seem like you should be able to do that, but it does work, which is pretty cool. And so long story short, if you're told, if you're given something like this and told to compute, you should be able to do that. And it's going to be very similar to this type of thing. Um, uh, there was one more thing I wanted to say. Oh yeah, finally, just what, what another way we could have looked at this because we kind of started off by saying, well, what would you do in this situation? You have X equals the square root of something. I don't know, maybe square both sides. Another thing we could have done was just recognize right at the very beginning that the very thing that we wrote down, that this thing was already embedded inside of it, right? X itself already showed up inside of it. I could say this is the square root of six plus, oh, all of that inner stuff is indeed the outer stuff. And so we could have started off, like if you noticed that right away, you could start off by making that your first step and then moving on. And we'd end up with the same thing, square both sides and you end up with this. And you say, oh, I have a polynomial. Let's set it equal to zero. Okay, that polynomial is equal to zero. We could factor it. And yes, you end up in the exact same place. But that's the idea. I don't know about you, but I think this is pretty cool. So... <laughs> Okay, are we ready to move on to imaginary numbers? Yes. Okay. Oh, come on, you. That red does not want to come off there. Okay. All right. So, up until now, we have said that we cannot take a square root of a negative number because it doesn't make sense. We said that the square root means, well, you took a number and you squared it, and now you're pulling that back. And so clearly it doesn't make sense to say that you squared a number and got a negative number. Well, now we're just going to say magically we could do that. We're going to imagine that you can, that you could take a square root of something. And in particular, we're going to look at the square root of negative one. We're gonna imagine that there's a number that when you square it, it gives you negative one. In particular, we're gonna say, okay, you take a number and you square it. Before we do that, let's just look at, let's just really, let's, let's really bring this home. I took a number and I squared it and it gave me four. What number squared gives me four? Two. Two. Two will work. Negative two will also work, but we just whatever. The point is, yeah, we're going to assume it's a positive number right now. So you yeah, took two times two and it gave you four. Okay, here's, here's the conceptual leap. You took a number, multiplied it by itself, and you got two. What number must that have been? Here's a hint. Another way of writing two is to write it as the square root of four, right? And this is another thing we've been doing, right? Is like, if we have something like this, the square root of three equals X and we wanted to solve for X or like, you know, yeah. If we wanna find out what does whatever, what we've been doing is squaring both sides, right? In other words, root three times root three equals whatever x squared, then you get this type of thing right here. Or I guess it would be better to do it like that. Whatever, you get the point. <laughs> and maybe you don't, but let's just move back on to here. What times itself is equal to two? Square root of two. Square root of two. Exactly. That's the thing. That is the thing that when you multiply it by itself, it gives you that number right there. 
That's just a fancy symbol for it. It actually yeah. works out to be 1.41, blah, 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 blah. But that's the symbol we use to mean the thing that when you multiply it by itself, it gives you that number right there. Therefore, what number multiplied by itself gives you negative one? Uh, square root of negative, but no, yeah, one times negative one. The square root of negative one times the square root of negative one, right? This is just what this symbol means. The square root right here. The square root of smiley face times the square root of smiley face gives you smiley face. That's the definition of what square root is, right? So no matter what you put in there, when you square it, it gives you back the thing that's on the inside. The only problem with all this is there is no such number until we say, let there be such a number. And that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to define this number is equal to I. In fact, I'm going to put three little things right there, meaning I is defined as this number. When you see those three, the equals with the three bars, it means that we are defining this thing. That is the definition of I, the imaginary unit. It is the number which, when you square it, it equals negative one. So let's do that. Let's, let's just look at this. Since I is equal to the square root of negative one, then I squared is equal to, well, square root of negative one squared, which equals what? Uh, uh, yeah. Negative one. Negative one. Okay. So this is the number that when you square it, it gives you negative one. Now let's notice something interesting about I. What happens when we cube it? Well, let's just see. I'm not going to use my brain yet. I'm just going to say, well, I means the square root of negative one. Cubing it means multiply it by itself three times. Okay. Root negative one, root negative one, root negative one. Okay. So we already did this one. In fact, it's on the board. What is this times this? That part of that right there is equal to what? Negative one. Negative one, negative one times, there's one left over, square root of negative one. But what are we calling the square root of negative one? What have we defined it to be? I. I. So this is just negative one times I, or we could rewrite that as negative I. Now, another way I could have done this, which, which is perfectly fine, and in fact, in practice, it's a little bit easier to do it this way, is to say, well, wait a second. I, any number to the third is equal to that number like that, right? Like A to the third is equal to A times A times A. And so I could rewrite that as A squared times A, and you'll see, yeah, that's, that's exactly what we did. When we peel all of those off, we said, well, I cubed is I squared times I. But I squared, by definition, is negative 1 times I. And so that's just negative I right there. OK, so that let's use that to help us with the next problem. We already know what I cubed. Uh, excuse me, can I erase this down here? Um, hold on. OK. No, I'm sorry. Okay. Yes. So we already know what I cubed is. So let's do I to the fourth. I to the fourth is just, we could do it this way. We could write out a bunch of negative ones. Let's, let's do that once. Let's just do that. 
we're going to say, okay, so it's negative one, the square root of negative one multiplied by itself four times. But hey, check this out. That times that is negative one, right? Like that's, that's what it means. The square root of negative one times the square root of negative one is indeed negative one. So that is taking these two right here and putting it, just combining those. We could play the same game here. We'll take these two, combine those to give me another negative one. What's negative one times negative one? Uh, one. Ah, interesting. Now let's just, let's see if that, if that works with the other way I was talking about. Let's split up i to the fourth as i to the third times i, right? That's, that's what that means, right? You have i to the fourth means i times i times i times i. And we have i to the third. We could rewrite that as do those three of them, then multiply by i. We know what i to the third is equal to. It's just equal to negative i times i, which now if I told you what is, let's just take a second. If I said negative a times a, you'd say, oh, negative a times a, that's negative a squared, right? Negative a squared like that. Right? Right? Like, check me on that. Is that true? If I have negative A, multiply it by A. It's the same as negative A times A. Yeah, because negative yeah. just means negative one out front. And so we could just pull that negative one out front. So this means the same thing. You have I cubed is negative I, or ah, check that out, negative one times I. That's all that means. And so you have the negative out front. And so i times i is i squared, so it should be negative i squared. But what's i squared? Um, negative one. Negative one. So we have a negative. Negative one. A negative negative one is what? Positive one. Positive one. So it, it is consistent here. But this is, this is something you're going to need, well, for the rest of your life, but in particular in your homework. Um, you're going to be given something like this. So let me know when I'm good to erase all that stuff. Almost. Hold on. Okay. And I'm going to put it up much more succinctly here in a second. Okay. Okay. So all together, we, we have this. We have i is just equal to i. And in fact, we could write that as i to the first is equal to i. I mean, yeah. i squared is equal to negative one. i cubed is equal to negative i. i to the fourth is equal to one. Therefore, i to the fifth. I don't need to write out I times I times I times I. I to the fifth is I to the fourth times I, right? Do you believe that? Mm -hmm. And we know that I to the fourth, every time you get back to fourth, you go back to one. So this is the same thing as just one times I. This is just I. And so this is probably the first time you've seen something, an operation that's cyclic. It keeps kind of coming back around. When you start at one, you're at I. You go to two, it bounces to negative one. You go to three, it bounces to negative I. And then at four, it comes back to one. And then it just keeps going around and around like that. So let's just do a couple more of these really drive the point home. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to rewrite it this way. I to the fifth is equal to just plain old I. So then I to the sixth, well, let's think about that. I to the sixth is equal to I to the fourth times I squared. Why did I choose I to the fourth? Well, because I know that I to the fourth is equal to one. 
And so every time we get back to four, that's just the same as one times I squared, which is back at negative one, right? It's the same thing there. Throw one more on there, I to the seventh. Well, I to the seventh is just I to the sixth times I, and we're back to negative I. So if you need that, let me know. I to the eighth finally comes back to one, and so on and so forth. I to the ninth, you're just I to the eighth is one. And so add one more i onto there, i to the ninth would just be i. i to the tenth, therefore, would be negative one. i to the eleventh would be negative i. And it just keeps going on and on like that forever and ever and ever in these groups of four. Any questions about that? Um, oh, wait. Yes. How did you get I to the eighth? Can you show me that again? Yeah, so I to the eighth. There's, and let's do this a couple different ways. So on one hand, we have that i to the eighth is equal to i to the fourth times i to the fourth. Do you believe that? Mm -hmm. Right, we have a total of eight i's. I could write square root of one, square root of one, square root of one, a total of eight times. Or I could group it in powers of four. And we know that i to the fourth is equal to one. And I to the fourth is also equal to one. So that's, that's one way we could do it. We could say that's one times one is just one. So that's one way. Another way, and actually just to drive the point home, let's actually, let's just do it. I to the eighth is the square root of negative one multiplied by itself eight times. So that's four, five, six, seven, eight. Now let's group these off in groups of two. The square root of negative one times the square root of negative one is what? Um, negative one times negative one times negative one times negative one. There you go. And so each one of these, now that I've grouped it into groups of two, right? The square root of negative one times the square root of negative one is just negative one. So each one of those comes out to be a negative one. But negative one times negative one is what? One times one. One times one, which is just one. And so, and you kind of see what's happening here with all of this is like, I'm, I'm kind of jumping to the chase with this nifty little thing that, you know, with a fifth and a ninth and that squared is the same as sixth and to the tenth. But it's because of this nifty little fact, right? Here. So, like, let's do it with to the seventh and we'll see why it's a negative i that's left over. So, i to the seventh is equal to square root of negative one times itself seven times. So, there's three, four, five, six, seven. And I'm going to group them off in groups of two, I guess. I can do this any way I want, but I'm choosing right now to do it this way. Okay. Square root of negative one times the square root of negative one is what? Uh, negative one times negative one. Uh -huh. Times negative one. Uh -huh. Times the square root of negative one. Times the square root of negative one. And so those first two negative ones we could get rid of. And that's just a one. So one times the negative one times the square root of negative one, which is just negative square root of negative one. And what are we calling the square root of negative one? I. 
i. So that's just negative i, which is what we said right there, that, that i to the seventh is that. So this is why it works out like this, is after you get, once you get two of them, you end up with a negative one. You get two more, oh, you're back to one. And so this is really, this is the key with these types of problems. And so uh, actually, so let's do an example that you're gonna see on your homework. Uh, can I erase what we have so far? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so how do we use this to compute, say, I to the 18th? And we're told to simplify this. I'm not gonna sit here and write down square root of negative one 18 times, although that's something it's totally in my character to do. We're not gonna do that. What we're gonna do is say, well, I know that every time I get four of them together, it just works out to be one. So if I could group this into groups of four, then I could make this work. So what I'm gonna do is kind of think about it like this. I to the fourth, oh, wait a second, four, four times four is eight, right? Four then times another, or sorry, four plus four is eight. Plus another four would be 12. Plus another four would be 16, and I have a total of 18, so I guess I'm left with two left over, right? Does this work out to be a total of 18 eyes? Yeah. Yeah, it does, right? Because I'm imagining each one of these is four. I've, instead of writing I, 18 times, I'm just saying, well, that's four of them. That's another group of four. That's another group of four. That's another group of four. And so each one of these is just one. So that's one times one times one times one times I squared. So that's one times I squared. That's just I squared. What is I squared? Uh, negative one. Negative one. I mean, yeah. Yeah, negative one. In fact, we could even... We defined I this way. We easily could have defined it to be the number that when you square it, it gives you negative one. We could define I this way. We could say, and they mean exactly the same thing. One is just a fancy way of writing the other one. And so we'll say these mean the same thing. I squared is by definition negative one. And so that's what you're going to do with these. Basically, it's like, 18 is what divided by four plus what? See, like we're grouping this into how many groups of four? Okay, I guess I need a total of that many groups of four. And then we know that's all gonna turn out to be one. And then you have whatever's left over. And the only possibilities, right? So for any one of these, can I erase this? Yeah. Okay. The only possibilities we have for any number here is that you have i to the fourth some number of times, and then there's only, it's either gonna be i to the first, i squared, i to the third, or i to the fourth left over. Of course, if it's i to the fourth, it would be something nice and even. It would be like i to the 20th. You'd say, oh, that's i to the fourth, total of five times. And then that just comes out to one. But this is the idea. You group it off into groups of four. Those guys are gone. And then you're either left with one, two, or three eyes left over at the very end. If it happens to be a power of four, they'll always come out to just be one. So let's check your understanding real quick. And you tell me what is I to the 15th? I to the fourth three times. Yep, I to the fourth 
three times, and then what's left over? Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> this one says that I to the third, I think. I to the third. That should work because this means you have I to the fourth, I to the fourth, I to the fourth, I to the fourth or a total of 12, then 13, 14, 15. It's I to the third. I to the fourth is just a one. And so one to the third is just a one. That's I cubed. But I cubed is equal to what? Negative I. Negative I. There we go. And that's that's the lesson. That's that's what you're gonna do. It's basically simplifying this bad boy. Given something like this, finding out how many groups of four can you pull off, then whatever's left. And then each one of those has a nifty little thing that i is just itself i squared is negative one i to the third is negative i and then finally i to the fourth comes back to one okay moving on so the book i said back in the day, <laughs> not too long ago. And when we had something like this, oh, and let's do this. We had something very similar to this. And the book told us that the way you do this is you go first, outer, inner, last. The first is square root of A times the square root of A. The book said, that this should be the absolute value of A. And then outer and the inner cancel, right? Because the outer is root A times root B with a minus. The inner is plus root A, root B, which cancel out, and so we're gone. And then the last gives you a minus root B, root B, which they told us is the absolute value of B. And I said, we're, forget the absolute Forget it, forget it. We are not going to deal with it. This is why. Because this is not true. <laughs> like, it's true if you restrict absolutely that you're never going to have negative numbers in here, but we're absolutely going to have negative numbers in square roots from now on. And so this isn't going to help us. So what we do, is when you have a negative number, let's say you have the square root of negative four. What we do is we basically pull out an I. How do we do that? Well, we say that a negative number is the same thing as negative one times whatever that number is. Does that make sense? Right? We're just, yeah. just multiply, right? It means the same thing. Then we're going to use our facts about multiplication in a radical to split this into two different numbers here. And so what's the square root of negative one? Um, are we doing big set? What? Wait, are we using the imaginary I thing? Oh yeah, from now on. From now on, we are always using it. So okay. square root of negative one is what? I. And what is the square root of four? Uh, two. Two. So I times two. Or in practice, you put your I in front of a root like that. And like I said, we're, anytime this is, this is a constant, you want to write things in front of it because this, it's like, is that, is that under the root or not? Like, did you write that right? It looks terrible. When it's a whole number, you usually write it at the end, which I'm sorry. It's just, it's one of those things that I'm going to do it every time. But yes, this is equal to 2i, okay? So now let's just think about this. And let's replace this guy, A, 
with negative four. And let's just see what happens here. Okay, so if this were a negative four, now remember, hold on, I'm gonna rewrite this down here. The book earlier claimed that this equals absolute value of A minus the absolute value of B. Now what we're gonna do is this. We're just gonna replace this guy right here. In fact, we're not even gonna worry about these Bs. Let's just look at what happens when we do our first. Well, from now on, from now on, and I'll say it one more time, from now on, anytime there's a negative number in a root, we are going to pull out an I, just like this. And really what I'm gonna do is skip this whole step right here where I, where I split it up. I know that negative four is equal to negative one times positive four. And so I'm just gonna pull out a negative as I. That's what I'm gonna do from now on. And so negative four comes out as I square root four. Okay, so this is also I square root four and then plus stuff that we're not even gonna worry about right now. Okay. So when I do my first multiplication, what is this times that right there? Um, I root four times I root four. Okay. I. How many I's do we have all together? Two. And so that we could rewrite as I squared. Root four times root four is what? Um, hold on. Uh, uh, I, sorry, I'm still catching up on writing. No problem. No problem. Uh, root four times root four is um uh, four. Right. I'm using this theorem right here. I'm gonna call this Justin's theorem. Root smiley face times root smiley face is smiley face. And so, yeah, right, the roots come out, and so we're just left with a four. What's I squared? Um, negative one. Negative one. So that's a negative four. Oh, yeah. Root smiley face, or <laughs> the root of smiley face times the root of smiley face comes out to be, what do you know? Smiley face, not the absolute value of it. That's not true, right? The, this is why I said forget about absolute value from now on, because I don't, I, I honestly, I don't know why the book even went into that. I was like, I mean, I do, it's, I, I think it's detrimental to think about it that way. This is the way you're going to be doing math for the rest of your life. When you have a negative in a square root, that's perfectly fine, because now we have the tools to deal with it. And it turns out to be consistent, whether or not you just look at it and say the square root of a negative number times itself, right? Like, well, that makes that number come out, whether it's positive or negative doesn't matter because we have this nifty thing called I and I comes right out of these guys and it makes everything consistent. And so this idea that it should have been the absolute value of that number, I just hated that they, that they said that. And so no more apps. And that's why I said, you know, however many lectures ago, do not worry about absolute values ever because they're gonna go away in just a second. So, okay. <laughs> so let's actually put this into practice. Um, let's look at this. So, okay, can I erase this stuff? Yeah. Did this example make sense why we're not, why the absolute value is not, we're not using it? <laughs> yeah. Okay. And so we could completely forget about that because now we have the tools to deal with the square roots of negative numbers. And that tool is I. Okay. So, or I is that tool. No, it doesn't work that way. Um, Okay, so let's put this into practice. Uh, let's look at this. We have the square root of negative five times the square root of negative 
three. Now, this is what this, what I'm going to write down right now. In fact, I want to do it in red, but I cannot find my red. Oh, man. Okay, I'm going to do it in a different color. This means that, that we are not going to do it this way. We are not going to do it this way. What you could do is say, ah, multiply two numbers together. That's the same as doing the square root of multiplying these numbers. Can you even see that? Yeah, barely. Minus five, minus three. A minus times a minus is a what? Positive. Right, and so you say, oh, that's five times three. That's just the square root of 15. But you'd be wrong if we're not playing that game anymore. From now on, whenever we have the square root of a negative number, we will immediately, the very first thing we do is write this as i to a positive number times i square root of a positive number. And if we really want to be pedantic, we can go through the steps and say, okay, what you did is took, you took negative one times positive five times the square root of negative one times positive three. And then you broke that down into the square root of negative one, square root of five, square root of negative one, square root of three. Those turned out to be i's. That was an i. That's an i. And so then you just end up right here. That's not, we don't need to do that because from now on, if you believe this, if you believe this in your heart of hearts and you could feel it to be true, it's perfectly fine from now on to say, oh, negative number, pull it out as, as an I and then make the inside positive. That's what we're going to do. So how can I rearrange this? Why don't we get the I's together? How many I's do I have? Two. Two, so that's i to the what power? Squared. And then we could rewrite this as five times three if we're so inclined, all in the same square root, right? I kind of skipped that step, but you see what I'm doing. What's i squared? Negative one. Negative one times the square root of 15, which is just negative root 15, right there. So you'll have a bunch of these types of questions. Um, just one thing to be careful about. If this were, oh, actually, this is a good one. We'll do, we'll do one more. We'll do one more like this. Negative square root of negative three. Square root of negative 15. What's the first thing we should do here? Um, uh, do the little thing so it's negative one times three, right? Well, we don't need to. If you, like I said, if you believe in your heart of hearts that that works, we could pull out the negative as what? I. As I. So I could rewrite this as what? Um, so the minus and then an I to the times the square root of three, or positive three, I guess. There you go, right, square root of positive three. We took the negative out as an I. We understand that what we've done is we've took negative one times three, and then we split it up like this. But this right here, this is what I mean by pulling out a negative as an I is because it works through these steps right here. But I don't need to see this every time. Like I said, if you believe it in your heart of hearts, you just pull it out like that. What about this guy right here? Um, it's just i times the square root of 15. There we go. Now let's rearrange this and what do I get? Um, I'm not looking for the final answer, just like the next step, like what's, 
what can we combine? I guess the eyes. Let's combine the eyes. Notice that negative sign. I'm going to make that negative sign just follow me down because really that's a negative one out in front, right? That's a negative one times all this stuff. So that negative is just coming along. And we combine the eyes and that gives me I to what power? I have a second. Yep. And then, and I, like I said, we're just going to do this one step at a time. Okay. So now what can we do? Um, I guess we can combine the square roots and then also negative i. So i squared is um, just negative one. So then, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you're you're on it. You're on it, right? Like that's that's what we're going to be doing. Um, what's fifteen? Can I factor fifteen? I don't think you can square it, can you? Whoa, fifteen yeah. equals what times what? And five. Three times five. Oh. That's what I was doing. Because we could do, like, we could have just said, well, that's three times 15. Three times 15 is 45. And we'd have the square root of 45. And then I have to wonder, wait a second, does that break down? Oh, yeah, that's a nine times five. And nine could come out of there. But if I just go ahead and factor it first, I don't know, it's, it seems a little bit easier to me than having to go through and use your brain for that part. But that's what I was getting at. Okay, so we can do this any way we want. I liked what you said about I. What can we do to I right now? Um, well, I squared is negative one and then a negative, negative one is just a positive one. There you go, there you go, okay. And so uh, what about this root? How do I rewrite this root in its simplified form? Um, we can take out a three and then adjust the square root of five. Here we go. So a negative negative one is a positive one. And so this works out to just be three root five. And so the point is be careful when you have negatives out in front of there. Don't just forget about them. And if you need to, you could rewrite this entire thing at the beginning as negative one times that thing. And so you would have had negative one times this each single time. And then finally negative one times negative one gives you a positive one and blah, 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 blah. But those can trip you up. And so we gotta be careful about that. Okay. Uh, Look, we're not gonna get on to seven, eight today but we do need to do a little bit more for seven, seven before I send you along your way. So uh, can I erase this? Yep. Okay. So we're just working with I and that's all we're doing at this point. So a complex number, I put this in quiz zero, right? That complex numbers, have this form, A plus I times B, where A and B are real numbers. And so complex, not because it's hard, right? Not complicated numbers, but complexes, and this is a complex. It's, they're two separate things that we're gonna combine to be one thing, and we call that one thing, a complex number. So for instance, if I have, yeah, that's Gail. We'll, we'll talk to her in just a second. So if I have two complex numbers, let's call them U and V. And let's say this one is that right there. That's a real number plus a real number times I. Okay, so by definition, that's a complex number. And this, call him V, is a complex number. Let's go one plus, oh, I don't know, two I. We can do a lot of things with complex numbers. Today, all we're going to do is add and subtract them. And let's just think about this. Let's suppose that I had two numbers, X and Y. And x is equal to 2 plus 3 root 2. 
and y was equal to one plus two root two. And I said, let's compute x plus y. Well, x would be two plus three root two, and y would be one plus two root two. And so how would we simplify this right here? Can, are there like terms that we could combine? Yeah. Yeah. What, what do you want to combine? So the two and the one is three. The two and the one make three. And then what do we have left? And then you have three square root two plus two square root two. So it's just like five square root two, isn't it? Five square root two. Exactly. Exactly. That's what you would do. Because you'd say, well, I have three oranges and I have a total of three and two apples. That makes a total of five apples. And that's what you would do. And there'd be no question about it. And remember, I is like the same kind of beast. I is a square root of something. And so we just do the exact same thing. We just pretend that we have a situation like this and we just add them together. So in a sense, all we're doing is adding the components together. This is called the real component. This is called the imaginary component. And just like with this, you have the pure numbers over here, which get added together. And then you have these funky numbers that get added together. But that's all we're doing with these guys. So if I wanted to compute u plus v, this would be this complex number, 2 plus 3i plus this complex number, 1 plus 2i. And how could I rewrite that? Um, well, we could do 3 mm -hmm. plus 5i, right? So that's it. It's that simple. But it gets more difficult when we subtract or when there's minuses in there somewhere. So if you have u minus v, then we're taking the complex number u, which is 2 plus 3i. And we're subtracting off, and watch how I do this, we're subtracting off the entire complex number v, which is 1 plus 2i. And so, right, that negative has to distribute into this guy right here to give us 2 plus 3i, and then what? How do I finish this sentence? Minus 1 minus 2i. There we go. And that works out to what? Um, 1 plus i. Plus i. And you can write that as 1i, but you usually don't. The same way you don't write 1x. You know, this is just like, yeah, and it's just like if you'd have the square roots, right? If you have 3 root 2 minus 2 root 2, you wouldn't write it as 1 root 2. You would just write it as root 2. And so i is just a shorthand for the square root of negative 1. And so you got that right there. Um, that should get you through all of your homework. The only thing is going to be that they're a little bit more, um, a little bit more involved. Like instead of them both being positive, one might be negative and the other might be negative. But it's exactly the same thing as if I told you to do something like this, and instead of it being i, it was an x. You're just treating it as a variable or as a whatever, as a root or however you want to treat it. But that's the idea. Uh, I don't think there's anything else we need to cover today. So if you have any questions. No questions. Questions, comments, okay. Okay. So, who's sleeping? Okay, so homework. Oh yeah, we're only doing section seven. Okay, so that makes it easy. Chapter seven, section seven. Then this is all from page 323, I believe. Yep, 323. And so part one.
Number five, 17, 33, and 35. <laughs> yeah, funny. Okay, so part two, oh, part one is due Tuesday at eight. Part two. Uh, let's see. Yeah, we'll do all of those. So, seven, nine, eleven. If there's doubles in here, like the last time, I, I tried my damnedest to make sure that the part one and the part two didn't overlap. And I looked and I was like, yeah, okay, wait, no, 17's up there. Oh, yeah, okay, we're good. Eight, 19 mm -hmm. down here. Okay. And then ended up screwing it up anyway. So if that ever happens, that's on me. And I've, yeah. So seven, nine, 11, 15, seven, nine, 11, 15, 19, 21. Some of these are super easy, by the way, like, like the last thing we just did, it's that straightforward. So this shouldn't take too long. Uh, 23, 27, 29, 31, 32, 33, 35, 37. Do Wednesday at eight. And that should be it.